Well, as I look at this Word of God, it looks to me like there's only two camps. There's Camp A and there's Camp B, or Camp 1 and Camp 2. It's, it's sort of a binary thing, sort of like yes or no, or is the door open or closed? It's, it's like a fork in the road. You either go left or you go right, and there's no middle ground. There's not a fence. You can't be a little squirrel that runs across the top of the fence. You're either on the one side of it or on the other side. And that, what I find in here is we're in the process of perishing or we're in the process of being saved. We're in the process of perishing or we're in the process of being saved. Now, I think I know, I think I know what, where we are, but it's not my decision. It's, it comes from the heart. It comes from the heart on whether you're in the process of perishing or in the process of being saved. Now, the reason I say that is this is so fascinating. What, when you're studying the Bible, um, you see that in verse 19 it says, For it is written, and he's looking back at Isaiah. Isaiah 29, 14. Now, he's quoting Isaiah 29, 14, but when you study the Bible, and you look back at what they're quoting, look around the scripture to see what else, what else is going on. It kind of like sets the stage and you kind of see why he might be quoting that scripture. And it's fascinating. The, the, the verse before that, Isaiah 29, 13, says, the, the Lord is saying, you honor me with your mouth and your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You honor me with your lips, but your hearts aren't there. Friends, we know this, that worship is a heart thing. Worship is, we don't come here to check off the Sunday morning thing. We don't come here just as simply a matter of tradition, like, okay, I gotta, I gotta sit in that particular pew on a Sunday between 1045 and, well, maybe some. Uh, okay, there's some hands going up. They do have to, but it's a, it's a heart thing, friends. True worship is like a rending of the heart. It's, it's a rending of the heart. So, so w where we are here is either, either, and when you're worshiping with the heart, you're actually in the process of being saved. You're in the, now, what's fascinating also about this is that the people who are in the process of perishing or the process of being saved, you know what the common ground is? You hear it. We're all in process. We're works in process. Or for you manufacturing people, whip. WIP, works in process, right? Or for the cookbook fanatics, we're, we're being chopped and blended and combined and, and placed in a preheated oven. Um, we're not done yet, right? The, the, the alarm hasn't gone off. We're not fully baked. Um, some are less fully baked than others, but, um, but, but we're not done. So we're, we're works in process. Um, now, where we're gonna go with this is, is we're gonna take a look at um, the process of being saved and, and what, this word has, what this word has for us. The first part of this is I'm going to talk about a, you may have remembered hearing this before, but it's a testimony of a gentleman back in the 1800s. And here he was, his heart was, he goes, I'm really looking for what it is to be saved. I don't understand it. I'm wondering how do I be saved? So I want to be in the process of being saved. So it goes like this, he's, he, it's, in a, it's in, a, in a winter time, there's a snowstorm, he's walking down the street, and he simply turns down an alley, and he comes upon a primitive Methodist church. And he walks into the primitive Methodist church, and he goes, you know, I don't know about, I've heard about primitive Methodists before. He says, they're the kind that, that um, sing so loudly that it makes your head hurt, but I'm still going there, I stopped in, there was 12 or 15 people there. He's like, oh man, this is, I don't know what this is gonna be like. 12 or 15 people in this church. The minister didn't come. The minister didn't come, so they're sitting there. Finally, a, a skinny little gentleman gets up into the pulpit and he said he's probably a tailor or a shoemaker or something like that. He, the skinny little guy gets up there and he says, ministers are supposed to be educated. He said, this guy was actually stupid. So, so this skinny, stupid guy gets into the pulpit and he says, he did have a text. He had a text 
And his text was Isaiah um, 45, 22. And his text was, it went like this, look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. And he said, he didn't have much to say about that text, so he has kept repeating it. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the church, all ye ends of the earth. And he says that he couldn't even pronounce the words very well. He, he couldn't pronounce the words, so he started out like this. He goes, well, it says look. Okay, we're going to look. Look, he says, it, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist, uh, and I'm making this part up. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to, sit, to look. You don't have to be a, a wealthy person to look. Even a child can look. He goes, you don't have to be making X amount of money to look. He says, you don't have to be educated to look, so we have to look. And then he goes, he goes, look unto me. He says, look unto me. And he says, Jesus Christ says this, look unto me and be ye saved. Look unto me. And he, and, he's, and he says that a number of times. Look unto me and be ye saved. Then he says, then he says and, and, and when we're looking at Jesus, we're looking at Jesus and he says, look unto me, I'm sweating drops of blood. Look unto me on the cross. Look unto me where I'm, where I'm speared, I'm broken, I'm, I die. Look unto me, I'm, I'm, I'm buried. Look unto me, I ascend out of the grave. Look unto me and I, I ascend to sit at the right hand of the Father. Look unto me, look unto me. And, he's, and, and, and he says, that's all he had to say. He says, and yet, but I thought, you know what, there might be a little bit of hope in here for him. And then he says, then the guy, when he comes to the end of that, he goes, he looks down at me, and well, there's 12 or 15 people, he knew I was a visitor, you know, he knew I was a stranger, and he says, he says, young lad, he says, you look miserable. And he says, I knew I was miserable, but I'm not used to preachers telling me that. Um, he goes, you look miserable, and you always are going to be miserable. You're going to be miserable in life, you're going to be miserable in death, until you look unto Jesus Christ and be ye saved. He says, I wish that you would do that right, right now today. And he's like, he's like, holy cow. He's like, I think, he says, I was willing to do 50 things, and all he's telling me is look unto Jesus Christ and be ye saved. He goes, finally, he says, my eyes were open. He says, I looked, I looked as best I could through these eyes. And he says, and the, the dark clouds went away, said, I started to see, and I, saw, I wouldn't jump up and sing like these primitive Methodists do. He goes, you know, I'm saved that I, I understand. He says, I don't know why no one told me this before. I don't know why no one told me before. So, friends, that's the testimony of Charles H. Spurgeon. Now, he was a pastor, um, and he actually, if you look him up, he is the most widely read minister of anyone in the in, in the history um, at the end of the 19th century he, there was a hundred million of his sermons he didn't preach a hundred million sermons but a hundred million of his sermons were printed and distributed now they say it's over 300 million the man is is called the prince um, the, the, the prince of preachers um, that's his testimony on how he got, how he went into the process of being saved Simply looking at Jesus Christ, looking at the message of the cross, which, which the world says is foolish. The world says is foolish. Now, that's the paradox. The paradox in this word of God is that the world thinks, looking at the cross, looking at where Jesus Christ died, is total foolishness. Total foolishness. And so, when we look at it, we look at it, I'll, look, I'll read 18 again. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's the power of God. Now, why does the world look at it as foolishness? Well, the paradox here is that the God of creation, the one who made you and made me and made everything in, in its beauty, would would come as Jesus Christ, would put himself on a cross, and would die 
a death like that. You see, the Jews, says in here, the Jews are looking for a sign. The Jews are looking for the knight in the white horse. They're looking for the domineering, um, the, 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 the powerful savior. They're looking to be extricated from Roman domination and rule. They're looking for that, that powerful person to come in and rescue them. And not only that, in Deuteronomy 21, it says anyone who is hung on a tree, anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed by God. So the cross is a clear sign to the Jews that this is not the Savior. He's cursed by God. Now, for us who are being saved, we know, yes, he was cursed by God for us. For us, to keep us off of there, to forgive our sins. We know that. Now, the Greeks, in the Greek age, the rock stars in the Greek age were, were philosophers who were eloquent in tongue, they were eloquent in rhetoric, they could, they could woo and wow an audience. Uh, a, a gift that I wish I had. Um, but that's what rock stars were in the Greek world. They were looking for the wise, intelligent, really smart person to, to make great decisions, to lead them, and that's what they're looking for. Now the question, the question is, do you see any parallels in the world today? Do you see any parallels in the world today, where we want the strong, authoritative, domineering, um, articulate one to make great decisions for us, to lead us, whether it's a, whether it's a mayor or a governor or a president, whether, wh wherever they are, we want, we want someone powerful to lead us forward. We want that, or you, we also want the really smart, cerebral person to make great decisions for us um, in research and in, you know, medical community. We want smart people. Well, I'm, let me say this as tactfully as I can. When we look for that, we are falling into the same trap, the same human tendency trap as the Jews and the Greeks who are looking for, toward human wisdom, human knowledge, human understanding, all these pow power and wisdom. They're looking for that they're not looking at God. They're not looking at Jesus Christ on the cross, which is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So this text, I think, is a clear signal to remind us that God's wisdom and power are made perfect in weakness. Perfect in weakness. And, and we see it all over the Bible. You probably see it in your own life. You see it in Moses who stuttered. You see it in David who d murdered in adultery. And you see it in little, little innocent, humble Mary, the mother of Jesus. You see it in the disciples who say, yeah, we're going to follow you right you know, anywhere. And then boom, the Romans come in. Boom, you don't see them again. Um, they're gone. You see it in Peter who denies Jesus three times. You see it all over the place. God's power is made perfect in weakness. It's in here and it's in here and it's it's actually thank God that, that he can use you he can even use me so it's, it's, we see that now final point I think is do we have to understand how this works in order to, um, to, to receive it and I say the answer is no because do you, do you understand how the electric motor works in your circular saw when you're cutting um, when you're cutting pieces for, um, for construction project. No, you don't have to know. The, the motor goes and the circular saw goes and you don't have to understand how it works. Do you have to understand how chemotherapy works um, to go through your body to, to eradicate cancer? You don't have to understand it. It just works. And you don't have to understand how a smartphone, you can, you can um, not only make phone calls, you can check your email and your calendar, your to-do list and all that. How does that work? I had no idea, but it works. So we don't have to understand how this is the, the, the image of God's wisdom and power. We just have to accept it, believe it, receive it, and live. That's, that's it. Now, finally, 20 years before uh, Charles Spurgeon passed away, he preached to his congregation and he says, he says, when you see me in a coffin going to the silent grave, he said, whether you've been converted or not, he said, I simply want you to say, he urged us 
in plain and simple language to think about e the eternity, to think about eternity, and he urged us in plain and simple language to look to Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus Christ. That's where we look. Amen.